Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas, arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. to Brave the Wild with me, your host, Paladino Joey. Brave the Wild is available on the sportstuff.com, iTunes, Stitcher, and Double Twist. Thank you very much for joining once again. It's nice to be back talking Minnesota Wild Hockey on a regular basis. Well, what the hell, huh? The torch is on. He's been, the offense is torching the opponents until last night, <clears throat> but we'll get to that shortly. Regular show, preview segment here, excuse me, review segment here, <laughs> preview segment next, and then wrap up with a check-in on the Iowa Wild and see if there's any minor fan interaction in there. Also, hope to get more of that in the future. So let's get ready to rock and roll. Minnesota Wild went to Edmonton, Alberta, Thursday, February the 18th. Sorry for the awkward pause there. I'm like, well, I just was blinking there, sleeping on the job, right? <laughs> Minnesota Wild head to Edmonton, Alberta and beat the Edmonton Oilers 5-2, to two, just like the previous night. They beat the Calgary Flames 5-3 to three in a fairly uh, sloppy game, but then again, Calgary's good at coming back. That's just kind of, they've been their history for, the, for like forever, pretty much, back to their Stanley Cup days, even though they haven't been a very good team for quite a while for the most part. Edmonton Oilers also another 80s, a great 80s team, but capable of making a playoff run once in a blue moon as they did back in 2006 to play the Carolina Hurricanes, which they lost. Um, I'm going all over the place. Wild beat the Edmonton Oilers 5-2 on a franchise that's extremely promising. I keep calling them the surprise team of the year. One of these years I'm going to be right. <laughs> Absolutely. And I used to call the, the uh, Islanders that, and I ended up finally being right. How they just you could see how they were going to come around. They were going to become a good team. But it's like not even a surprise necessarily. But they're going to show up compared to the year before. They're going to be significantly better. So it's like that type of surprise. Uh, the surprise though here is that guys are scoring that didn't used to score. That's what's so fantastic about the whole Torchetti uh, uh, approach now. You get Jason Pominville not getting his sixth, not getting his seventh, but his eighth goal of the year now. Now he's just continuing to score on the power play midway through the first period. A nice pass from Granlund and Vanek setting him up as well. Granlund just getting the job done there. He's starting to rack up the points too. You get all these names that are finally playing good now. And then Dumba just continues to score on the power play as well. He also is eighth goal on the season on the power play, putting the puck on net like he does. And rocking and rolling. Of course, this one, he was actually crashing the net, and it was a beauty. You'll hear that in the, in the next game as well. You're seeing a lot of familiar faces scoring, and which is good, during the course of this week. But And that some of them had been unfamiliar for the longest time. I mean, Mikhail Granlin had maybe his best game of the season in Edmonton. He was able to score in the second period, making it 4-2, to two, putting the Wild ahead, and pretty much putting the game on ice at that point, for the most part. But, but then again, not really. You know how teams can come back. But giving the Wild a two-goal lead, Vanek also adding his 16th of the year, uh, kind of a one-timer-ish, and Mike Riley getting his first assist. As he's going to start to rack up some assists as well, starting to show some of that offensive capabilities. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Koivu, Riley pretty much passed it down to Koivu. Koivu behind the net, kind of a centering uh, pass to Vanek, who is crashing the net, which, again, that's Torchetti's uh, MO. <laughs> attack the net, attack the net, attack the net. <laughs> and it's working. That's what's good. You're seeing a wild offense score more goals than we have seen in the history of the franchise. They're actually scoring goals. And when you consider the course of uh, Torchetti's start here, the first four games, 21 goals scored in the first four games of Torchetti's tenure with the Minnesota Wild. That is some serious stuff right there. That's fire, baby. That's fire. <laughs> Lighting a fire under certain people, pushing the right buttons, but most importantly, just rock and fire. Stop thinking about it. Just rock and fire. Granlin, 
uh, Palmanville guys like that. Even Vanek again scoring. Coyle for the second night in a row, adding an empty netter, is 18th of the year, continuing to rack things up. Unfortunately, you won't see Coyle score again uh, in the next two games, so that's unfortunate. He kind of dropped off a bit, especially last night against the uh, New York Islanders. But maybe he's hurt, maybe he's tired a bit, but hopefully he'll be able to come back and uh, start playing at the level he'd been playing at for such a long time. But you won't be hearing Charlie Coyle getting the uh, the Mike Madonna Award for this episode. In fact, he didn't get it last episode either. But you're seeing strong play out of guys that had been so quiet for so long. You're even seeing Koibu starting to rack up the points again, maintaining his his lead uh, for the Wild in overall points. Uh, points. He's the point leader for the Wild for the season at this stage. Uh, Yak, Yakupov with a nice unassisted goal at one point in the game. Kind of disappointing. At the same time, a mistake by the Wild. Fifth goal of the year for Yakupov. He's, it was a nice play. Connor McDavid, though. Wow. Oh, man. That son of a biscuit. Like, there's nothing you can do. You turn the puck over, and that guy's gone. He may be another Patrick Kane there for the Edmonton Oilers. We're going to have to watch out for him. Good thing they're not in our division, but unfortunately, they are in our, uh, they are in our conference, so we may meet in the playoffs one day. Benoit Puglia, 21st assist of the year, along with Jordan Eberle, who uh, is another solid player for this uh, Edmonton Oilers team as they continue to rise up. Puglia, one of the better players on the roster, and it's kind of funny how that turned out. Remember how, once upon a time, it's been many years now already, the Wild traded Puglia for Guillaume Lantan dress, and we're all excited, because I was digging through all the NHL trades, I was just sitting for hours, just staring at the screen, digging at all the trades, the Wild history, the North Stars history, it's kind of fun to look at, but it can drive you crazy too, like so many trades, it just drives you nuts, Ben Puglia, you know, he'd been a bust, fourth overall pick, all that, and he wasn't anything special when he went to Montreal for a while there. But Guillaume Lachandres had such a promising start for the Wild and then just vanished. Just did absolutely nothing. And Puglia's still in the league, and he's one of the better players in the Edmonton Oilers now. And what's also crazy, the guy isn't even 30 yet. Doesn't that just drive you crazy? He's he's younger than Crazy and Suter. I'd take Benoit Puglia on the Wild right now. If, if, he, if, if he were a free agent in the summertime... And, and he wanted a reasonable contract, bring him in for a couple of years. It wouldn't kill me. It really wouldn't kill me, man. Oh, Ben Wapulia. Mm, son of a gun. Hopefully he would work out here. I think he would, uh, depending, uh, no, no matter who the coach is necessarily. With Torchetti, he would definitely start racking up some points. Mike Riley overall had two assists in the game. He assists on Thomas Vanek's goal and Mikhail Granlin's goal. His sixth of the season. Woohoo, sixth of the season. But Riley, again, factoring in the offense, kind of getting the offense started. And that's what offensive defensemen do. You had Riley kind of getting it over to Dumba, putting the puck on net. Granlin attacking the net. Torchetti and finishing sixth goal of the season. Wild win. Five to two. Another extremely uh, impressive effort offensively for the Wild. I mean, they're, they're just going in now. It's plain and simple, and it's because the Wild are more aggressive offensively than they were under Mike Yo. They're not gripping the stick the way they were before. They're just rocking and firing and attacking, and boom, the puck's going in. Surprise, surprise, right? Sunday, 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 February the 21st, the Minnesota Wild finally have their first outdoor game. And I have a recommendation that I'm sure... You know, let's just say I'd be fr- freaking shocked if anybody disagreed. But uh, those stadium series uniforms, if that's the only time they wear those, that is a rotten, crying, insane shame. I mean, are, are you kidding me? Uh, you know, those need to be the third jersey for the Minnesota Wild. On like maybe a Sunday type of thing. You know how the L.A. Lakers wear white jerseys on Sundays, holidays type of stuff. That type of thing sometimes. You know, teams like that, they wear special jerseys. The Twins wear special jerseys on, like, Sundays or certain, like, Memorial Day type of thing, Labor Day, that type of deal. These should be the wild Sunday or holiday jerseys. Without a doubt, that should be the third jersey, and that leaves one jersey out. And which one do you think it is? Well, it's the red one, damn it. Of course it is. Well, this is the most, this one would be the most red jersey for the wild. No reason to really necessarily get rid of the green ones. I think they're just fine. Um, they're not very exciting. But they're they're okay. You could almost you could almost say these should be the main wild jerseys, and then they <laughs> make the green ones like the Sunday one, the the other green, the regular green ones, the plain Jane green ones with no logo on them. And then of course the white jerseys are absolutely fantastic. Those are that that they're a work of art. They did a wonderful job with those. And then there's the other one that's been kind of floating around. Um, that was originally looked on as a stadium series uh, idea for the. Wild, where it was North Star colors with the Wild logo, and it had the see because you notice these jerseys have the stripes that the uh, the early '80s, late '70s North Stars jerseys had. Now 
See, you had the big yellow and the big uh, white stripe on the late 70s, early 80s jerseys. And then the black stripe came in in the later half of the 80s, and that's when those are the jerseys the North Stars wore in their 91 finals run uh, and all that. Uh, the 81 finals run were when they wore the uh, the other ones. See, these are similar to the uh, the early 80s ones because, you, you know, you have that big red stripe on the top, which is kind of a classic look for a hockey jersey, and then you have the uh, the larger size stripes uh, around the elbow area, elbow, bicep, whatever, pretty much the elbow area, like the old Minnesota North Stars ones had. Um, beautiful jerseys. They did a great job on these things. It's kind of wild North Stars mixed in a sense. And at the same time, there's teams like Ottawa Senators, Philadelphia Flyers, teams that wear classic, that wear cool type of jerseys, third jerseys out there. Why can't the wild have this and just dump the red one? I mean, is there any reason why they shouldn't? I think it's time, guys. I think it's time. And I I would be absolutely shocked if these jerseys were uh, a one-time deal. But I'd also be surprised if they were just like a once or twice a year deal either. They need to be a regular jersey, and they will sell like hotcakes. The red jerseys have been around for over 10 years, and the Minnesota Wild are not the Boston Bruins, not the Toronto Maple Leafs. You know, you get the idea. We're not an original six team. So those red jerseys are not untouchable. And you know what? If you have one, fine. You know, it's a wonderful item. I have one. I met Tim Palenti when I was wearing mine years ago at the skills competition, the annual skills competition for the Wild way back in 03 when Tim Palenti was a pretty new governor at the time, patted me on the back, said, I like your jersey. So I have that wonderful memory of it and I'll keep it. I mean, I'm not going to burn it, not going to throw it away. It'd be nice to get an autograph on it sometime, but I have no problem moving to these uh, new ones. So there you go. I had to get that off my chest before I continued. Eric Halla, you son of a gun, boy. You've been really listening to Torchetti, haven't you? You know, when he took him aside and told him, do this, this, and this, and he's still listening to Torchetti. Granlund and Eric Halla, man, you guys are really stepping up and doing a phenomenal job. I mean, they deserve so much credit, and it's fantastic to watch. Yes, it was easy to get frustrated. Uh, Halla had been quietly getting better during the course of the season. Granlund, well, you know, he's always been kind of hanging around in the... Uh, you know, sixth, seventh range and scoring on the team. There was a point he was fourth on the team in scoring when he was on a on a point streak. But um, miraculously, Granlin's got what thirty two points on the season. So he's as he frustrating as he's been. He's still got some points. Eric Hall has passed the twenty mark for the first time in his career, and I, you got to think that's going to keep going up. He had an absolutely phenomenal game and a six to one victory over the Chicago Blackhawks. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you can tell I'm a little bit excited about this one. It was a lot of fun, though there's the old curse, the old worry about this too. Chicago Blackhawks, you know, the, <laughs> they uh, the wild regular season for show and the Chicago Blackhawks postseason for dough. You know, that whole thing, that's a PA bit. But at the same time, you know, and PA is much more of a homer than I am. But I mean, it's one of those facts where the wild have had a lot of success against the Blackhawks in the postseason the past couple of years. And in the playoffs, it was like, well, do we need to go back over that again? I, I don't think so. Uh, but this was this one seemed different. Like it, the Wild just looked absolutely phenomenal from the get go. It was just boom, 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 boom. I mean, Dumba attacking the net after uh, <laughs> Carter and Fontaine putting the puck on the net, bouncing it off of uh, Crawford, who was in net. You know that guy. <laughs> Dumba just attacking that net and getting it past him real early in the game. Only three minutes in. Ninth goal of the season for Dumba. Attacking the net for a defenseman. Sometimes it's risky, but hey, if you're a scorer like Dumba, who might be the next, uh, you know, Brent Burns, at least in the, in the in the Wilds case, there you go. Ninth goal of the season. Absolutely fantastic. And then you have Vanek rifling one past Crawford. Again, another one-timer type of goal. That's pretty much how Vanek scores for the most part. It's just... He's more of a one-time type of guy. He's not really a make-a-move type of guy. It was a nice one, though. A nice rifle shot on the power play. Pominville getting another point with an assist. And then a, and Mike Riley on the power play. And I think he's going to continue to be there at times under this uh, this new coach. It's not a new regime yet. And I have no problem keeping the assistants. There's not one assistant on this staff that I would say, you know what, eh, I think I think we could get somebody better. Yeah, I, I, I love Andrew Brunette and, and Darby Hendrickson. I mean, there's so much good history from them, and they know so they have so much knowledge. And then Daryl said, oh, he won the Stanley Cup with the Stars. And he was a great defenseman for many years. I got no problem with him either. The Wild defensemen have done well under him. So, yeah, keep them around, in my opinion. But we'll see what happens. Uh, things change. They always do. Um, Nito Niederreiter also 
scoring his 11th goal of the season. Eric Halla assisting Pominville with another assist. And Pominville having probably... <laughs> Eric Holland, Pominville with three points apiece in this game. I mean, was, was this Pominville's best game? Was the Edmonton game Pominville's best game? No, I mean, I think Granlin was the player of the game for Edmonton. But for Chicago, who was it? Was it Pominville, Eric Holland? I, I, I'll probably go with Holland at this point by a, by a narrow margin. Even Ryan Carter was fantastic with a goal and an assist in the game. Again, just grinding it out. You're just seeing a totally different team here. And Pominville with kind of a uh, a Vanek type of goal, but better. Uh, more more mustard on it. That's what I liked. It was just, it was such a quick release and so much power off a nice pass from Nino Niederreiter. Just, you know, as Nino Niederreiter was getting his nose dirty, getting it back to Pominville. Ninth goal of the season. Again, rock and fire. I mean, what more can you say? That was pretty much Pominville there. And it's an interesting line, by the way, also. Eric Halla, Pominville and Niederreiter. That's been a line of late. And the chemistry's been good. And that was another thing that Mike Yo, he was kind of sticking with the same lines regardless of they're working or not. And he'd make some changes, but they'd be just, they wouldn't be complete changes. And these are like complete changes. You, you never saw these guys together, and they're doing really well. It's pretty cool. And that line dominated this game, to be quite honest. It, it really did. And Pominville. Looked really good the whole day, and Eric Hall looked really good the whole day, and he finished an empty netter late. I don't know why Chicago was pulling the goalie necessarily, but I don't know. They're just being the, the Blackhawks, I suppose, after Patrick Kane. Of course, if one guy's going to score, it's Patrick Kane. He was alone for like a split second there, and he finished for his 35th goal of the season, leading the league in scoring in points, not in goals, but in points. He's just dominating 80-some points on the season, way up there ahead of everybody. It's just sick. How good uh, Patrick Kane is right now, and it's unfortunate as well. He's he's coming into his own right now. Um, that sucks for us, but uh, whatever. <laughs> I guess it's good for hockey, I suppose. But an overall dominant game for the Wild. They just had fun out there, and uh, and after they're watching the old North Stars in the jerseys for the last time, and some old Wild players in North Star jerseys, so cool to watch. Uh, you saw you saw Wes Walls in a North Stars jersey, Andrew Brunette, Darby Hendrickson, but then you saw Madano again, and you saw <laughs> you saw Don Beaupre, you saw Gilles Molesh, uh, just so many names out there that have been uh, around. Of course, uh, <clears throat> Lou Nanny and Tom Reed in those classic North Star letter jackets, coaching the uh, the North Stars. Let's just call them what they were, what they were, and what they are, the North Stars. But to see. North Star uniforms on the ice again. It, it, it was just amazing, and you know, and it brought it brought tears to to the eyes of a lot of people out there, a lot of names as well that have been familiar to us for so many years. Dino Cicerelli, Neil Broughton, just a fantastic, touching weekend. It was so cool to see them one last time, and uh, Judd Zolga during the course of the week uh, also uh, kind of gave it like a, he said it best by saying it brought closure. To us North Star fans who missed them so much and hadn't seen them in those uniforms for so long. We hadn't seen those uniforms on the ice in many years. Since since the 91 finals is the last time those uniforms were on the ice. Do you, do you realize how long ago that is? That's 25 years ago. 25 years ago. That sucks, man. But they were there they were one last time and it was just so amazing to watch. Oh. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm getting emotional just thinking about it right now. Do you, just seeing all those names one more time. And, and and how good some of them still are, even at their old age. They couldn't play in the NHL because they'd get hurt right away just because your body's too old to play. But the skill is still, it, it never really goes away. You know, like you see an old basketball player, they can still dribble, they can still shoot. Like Michael Jordan could still turn around on somebody pretty easily. Even current young players, he still could turn around and hit a shot at him. He, but he couldn't go out and run on the court anymore. No, I mean, it's just one of those type of things. That's pretty much the theme of the, the old age. But the skill still there. They, they never really do lose it. The stick handling was still there. The quick hands. Just beautiful thing to watch. It, it's fun to see those old guys out there showing the talent they still have. Even the old Blackhawks. You know, those guys too. But, you know. <laughs> oh, man. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, you saw Scott Darling in there. That's how rough it was for Corey Crawford. It's just one of those it is what it is type of things in his situation. Dubnik was fantastic the whole game, facing 32 shots again, only letting the same nemesis, the same guy, Patrick Kane, score on the wild. I think when Patrick Kane's season or his career is over, I think he will be the leading scorer of uh, you know wild opponents. <laughs> 
think there's any doubt at this point in my mind that Patrick Kane will have the most points, most career points against the Minnesota Wild of any NHL player when all is said and done. I mean, every time he plays against us, he scores. Just like it was for the longest time with um, with uh, Jerome McGinley. It just went on and on and on every single game. The frustration was just unbelievable every time. Like, you'd have Calgary 2, Minnesota 2. Here comes overtime. Five seconds in. Again, let's scores! And Calgary wins, and there you go. Great. Again, law. Again. And it was every freaking time. But that's just, yeah, that's just how it goes. Luckily, again, let's not on the Flames anymore. And our success rate against the Flames is quite different. Yeah. Well, let's talk about success rate against the New York Islanders. It was fun while it lasted in the past, but this was a real lousy year against these Islanders. Just lousy. You had a backup goalie in net last time around because the Halak wasn't healthy. And that guy was coming back for the first time in a little while. And the Wilds still didn't win the game because they were extremely soft, sloppy. It was a 5-3 to three loss back on February the 2nd, Groundhog Day. Oh, boy. 5-3 to three loss, and that goalie mm-mm-mm, just frustrated the heck out of us at the end of the day. It was uh, John Francis Barube. Yeah, I almost forgot about him, Barube. Uh, for the New York Islanders, he stopped the Wild enough in that one, but this time Halak was back, and he looked like he was back, and the Islanders are on a roll right now, and they beat the Wild 4-1 to last night. All oh, the attack, the net, the good passing, the tic-tac-toe. Like, see, it was a tic-tac-toe play to Pominville when he scored his ninth goal of the season. What the hell was this? It was terrible. A 4-1 to loss at home. The Wild haven't won a game in Exit Energy Center since uh, 1978, it feels like, right now. I thought Lou Nanny was on the last team that won in Exit Energy Center. Like, playing. Not coaching or GMing. Playing. That's the last time. This was t- a terrible game. Um, listless. It was kind of like the Boston Bruins game when Yo got fired. Okay, maybe not that bad. But it was a game where this team was out of sync. They weren't the same team anymore. Um... Uh, it's going to happen. You're going to have a bad game. It's like you might as well have one now, I guess. You temporarily end the streak. Hopefully you come back and play better in the next couple of games here. I'm going to preview four games in the second segment, by the way. But uh, Martin just slipping that thing past real early. And it was like he just had a bad feeling real early. Like he, it just slid right through. Like it was going through like a, like a, like a pet door, you know. Just slid right through there like, like a little mouse. Not him, but the puck was like a little mouse sneaking through a little, a little crack in the door. Like you got to be kidding me. And then Franz Nielsen on the power play, 17th goal of the year. Damn it. That's, of course, the top line for the New York Islanders, making it 2 nothing midway through the first period. Not a good feeling in this one. And Devin Dumnik wasn't as sharp, and the offense wasn't as sharp, and the passing was kind of not there. It was kind of the same team that got Yo fired, but not quite as bad. It was like a, but it was kind of like reverting back to their old, weak, kind of tired-out-looking habits. It, it, just, this team looked tired, they looked lazy, they looked bored. I, I don't know what the hell it was. Porter coming back for the first time in a while. Not because of injury, but because of availability. Um, other players were... Uh, <laughs> well, because Jason Zucker, of course, had a concussion in the Chicago game. I might want to mention that. Kind of a cheap hit. Obviously, he didn't even have the puck. He was just smashed in the face. You just knew right away he had a concussion with the way his, his head just rattled when he hit the ice. That was not a good sign. I'm hoping for the best for him, but then that makes Chris Porter available, and he's able to net his fourth goal of the season off of a pretty good pass from uh, Granlin. Of course, Granlin trying to get the puck on net as well at the same time, and Porter finishing on it, and it was a good one indeed. It was actually a pretty nice goal for a guy who's more of a fourth-line role player, and of course he has the same name as one of my buddies out there from the thesportstuff.com and on Facebook and all that. Big hockey fan, Chris Porter, if you're listening, I'm giving you a shout-out. He's in, he's in Idaho at this stage. He's kind of moved around in his life from Pittsburgh, San Jose, and uh, uh, Idaho at this stage. I'd love to see Idaho, by the way. But uh, <laughs> Chris Porter from Minnesota. Fourth goal of the season. Uh, nice to see him out there. Nice to see him scoring. Good for him. But the rest of the team, non-factor. And it seems like that's the case when you get the fourth liners. They're the only ones scoring. This team is not playing well at all. Uh, it's just sad that it comes to it. Like a Porter goal should be more of a bonus type of thing. Not saying he lacks skill necessarily, but uh, well, he's not the guy. You see, if if he's the only guy scoring out there, you're not playing well at all. Uh, John Tavares reminding us just what he is—a top overall pick, twenty <laughs> third goal in the season on the power play. A really nice play there early in the second in the, th- the third period. Pardon me, after Chris Porter netting his goal with less than thirty seconds remaining in the second period, making it two one, making us all believe. But Tavares slammed the door on us right away. Early on the power play, the Wild just 
Undisciplined overall in this one. And then Nielsen wrapping it up with a shorthanded empty net goal. The Wild had, were, had, had a six on four and they couldn't get the job done. Instead, they give up a shorthanded goal. The France Nielsen was ultimately the player of the game. Two goals in this one. His 17th and 18th for the New York Islanders. The Wild special teams play was lousy. No power play for the Wild. And they gave up two, uh, two power plays. And, of course, they... Gave up a shorty. So, the short, uh, obviously, special teams were not special at all in the New York Islanders game. And basically, the whole theme of this one is Wild Rod is and Torchetti was saying how they weren't attacking the net. They weren't, uh, they just weren't doing what they were doing before. They weren't doing what they were doing the first four games. It was just a quiet, sleepy effort, just like before. And just like we saw several times earlier in the season under Mike Yo. Hopefully they can shake out of it sooner than later. But um, Torchetti sounds pretty confident that the team will turn it around pretty quickly and everything will be fine. So there you go. <laughs> He's not losing confidence in the team at this stage. And Torchetti, of course, certainly not the type of guy that would do that. So let's wrap things up with the award segment. Mike Badano Award. Hmm. It's going to go to... Mm, oof, eesh, ah, ooh. Uh, I'm going to give it to the guy who was probably the most consistent overall player during... This week, this past week, the three games. Can, can I do it? Is it okay? Will you, will you forgive me if I give it to this guy? But uh, it's going to go to Mikhail Granlin. What a nice week for Mikhail Granlin. Honorable mention to Jason Pominville. Those two names were at the... Uh, <laughs> they were facing the brunt of the James Shepard Award all week. Or, I mean, all season, pardon me. All season. But this week, they're kind of like the, the top two guys. Mikhail Granlin's going to get it. And then, of course, another honorable mention to Eric Halla. There were several guys that played so well all week. And then the uh, James Shepard Memorial. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's almost like... Gran- that first goal, Granlin, it seemed like he lost control of the puck there, but I'm not going to give it to him. He or he didn't, he didn't, he just, he went after the puck and didn't knock it away, and then Martin was able to tip it through uh, Dubnik, but I'm not going to give it to him. That was just one play there. He played fairly well most of the week. I, I, I'm just going to give it to the Wild special teams against the Islanders game, I guess. I mean, it was just a lousy one. Uh, other than that, I mean, the Wild played so well the, the, the first two games. Uh, nobody majorly stood out like they totally sucked out there, to be quite honest. I mean, all all the players played well during the course of the week for the most part. So I'm going to right now give the James Shepard Award to the Wild Special Teams in the New York Islanders game. So with that, we'll take a break, come back, do some previews, and then wrap it up with Iowa Wild and uh, checking in on some of the other prospects out there. back here on Brave the Wild, segment number two, preview segment, and Iowa Wild conversation, and other prospects. Here we go. The Minnesota Wild head to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Thursday, February the 25th. Do the Wild win this one? Well, the Philadelphia Flyers are in like sixth place, seventh place in their division. They're str- that's a tough division over there, Metropolitan. Uh, Flyers, though, have a winning record, believe it or not. It's a, it's a fairly good Eastern Conference. It's actually deeper in the East than it is in the West right now because over in the Pacific Division, you got inferior teams leading the way over there. Uh, the Sharks, though, they've been catching up in Anaheim. Yeah, I'm going to talk about them in a second. Almost going to talk about it now, but maybe I will talk about it right now so I don't forget. <sighs> Boy, it looks like I told you so about the Anaheim Ducks, didn't I? Mm. Even though they started the season so terribly, uh, but before they started terribly in the season preview, I picked the Anaheim Ducks to win the Stanley Cup at the beginning of the season. And, um, well, I, I, I've had the Wild going all the way to the Western Conference Finals, but then running into frickin' Anaheim, as I called them. And they're going to go all the way, win the Stanley Cup over the New York Islanders this season. Still could happen. Um, they are one point behind the LA Kings right now. They're just sitting right there. They've been on an unbelievable run. They're ahead of the Wild now, and that sucks. It really sucks. It sucks to see them doing as well as they are, but back to where we were, Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, it's a tough matchup. The, another team the Wild used to have success against, but they haven't been having it lately. Uh, they struggled against them last year, and they struggled this year. The Wild mustered a point January Thursday, January the 7th, but that was right about when the Wild's 
fortunes started to really, really change after a solid month of December. The swoon just pushed a month ahead. That's all that really happened. The script was just a month late. That's all, right, Chance? <laughs> he was asking me, is this a script, right? He was kind of teasing me about the name of one of my uh, episodes earlier in the season. Yep, it's a, it was a script, all right, but if that script has been thrown away and torched by Torchetti at this stage. We'll just hope it doesn't continue. 4-3 uh, to three loss to Philadelphia last time around. What are the Wilds' hopes going into Philly this time? Well, judging on the way the Wild have played at home the last month or so, about the last six weeks, I think the Wild win. Uh, the Wild's road record is better than their home record for the last uh, six weeks or so. I think the Wild win this game. Uh, Philadelphia is not that good. They're decent. They're four games above 500. They have 64 points on the season, which is right about where the Wild are, which is kind of sad. Uh, no, 63 points for Philly, 64 for the Wild. Both teams, four games over 500. The Wild have played 60 games. Philadelphia has only played 59, so only one last. It's just one game in hand, as they like to call it. Um, Philadelphia is going to have a hell of a time uh, over there, but then again, eh, it's it's doable, and the Wild is doable to make the playoffs as well. It's going to take a little extra effort. Uh, Nashville has ended up uh, getting on a hot streak, and that really sucks for the Wild again, because Colorado was the one that was ahead. Nashville was the one the Wild were two points behind. Now Nashville's five points ahead. And Colorado's two points ahead, so despite a four-game win streak, the Wild maintaining their position in the Western Conference and in the Central Division. So there you go, bouncing all over the place, but that's how it goes. Dallas has taken over the divisional lead in the Central Division and the top record in the West at this stage. Washington Capitals, which will be the next opponent for the Wild. 92 points, best in the league, 44-10 and 10 on the season. Third, they're only 34 games above 500, that's all. Just 34, you know. Mm. But uh, back to the point here. I know I'm bouncing around, but it's relevant information, right? I mean, you know, it's not like I'm talking about cooking recipes or anything, right? <laughs> so, yeah, the Wild should beat this club. Uh, Philadelphia, they're a decent team. They're a team that I think could be in the playoffs, but we'll see. Uh, Jero, their best player day-to-day with an upper body injury uh, as of February the 20th. We'll see what happens. Uh Mason most likely will be a net for the Philadelphia Flyers. And he's having a not-so-good year. He's another one of those hit-and-miss guys. He's got three shutouts on the season, but his goals against average is 2.7. And save percentage, nine player point nine one five, And he's two games under five hundred on the year. Seven overtime losses. He's been snake bit over the course of time for the Philadelphia Flyers. He's kind of been their main starter for the most part. That's being Steve Mason. Uh, if he is a net, I think the Wild should win the game, unless he flat shuts us out like Halak did last night, other than Porter sneaking one past. We'll see what happens there. But I think the Wild should win the game. We'll go with 4-3. to three. Uh, Philadelphia's got some, some talented players on their roster. That's, there's just no doubt about that. Again, Giroux. If he's not healthy, though, the Wild absolutely should win 4-2, to 4-3. to three. Either way, I think the Wild will win. Um, they're seventh in the Metropolitan Division, by the way. It's Philadelphia. It's kind of... It's a huge division. Seven, eight teams in that one. Uh, Columbus riding at the bottom, way behind Philly at this stage. Uh, New Earth is, well, he's having a much stronger season than Mason at this stage. He also has three shutouts at his goals against average 2.21. Hmm. So I hope he's not in net, and if he is, uh, that sucks. Uh, Jero having a strong season again. Vorostek as well, who was a who was a thorn in our side. Wayne Simmons has always played well against the Wild as well. He has 40 points on the season. It's a te- it's a team that's better than their record, but then again, you could say that about everybody. You could say that about us too. I think the Wild, the way they've been playing under uh, Torchetti, I think they'll get their offense back in gear, and they will beat the Philadelphia Flyers 4-3. to You'll see more aggressiveness. You'll see a team that's uh, pissed off about losing to the Islanders the way they did, and I think they'll play better and beat the uh the Flyers, but the Flyers, again, will make their mark. They will score three goals in the game. Maybe the Wild get their first overtime victory <laughs> of the season. It'd be about freaking time. I'd, like to, I'd basically like to drop an F-bomb on this one. This next preview might be fairly short. Washington Capitals. Oh, goody. Aren't you excited about going to Washington? Isn't that exciting? And it's a back-to-back. Oh, that spells a victory right there. Well, the Wild will beat Philadelphia and have their 66th point in the season and 28th victory, but they will have their 24th loss as they head to Washington Friday, February the 26th. 4-2 to two Washington Capitals with Holtby in net and all those talented scores. Oh, man, TJ Oshie. TJ Oshie's, uh, you know, he's, he's certainly not their best player, but he's one of their, you know, he, he's, 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 he's doing well in Washington anyway. He's doing better than he was in St. Louis. 
and you got Backstrom, you got Ovechkin. <laughs> Unless they get injured before the game, something like that, something takes place, I think this team is probably going to, you know, they're going to look, they're just going to outclass the Wild, I think. Uh, it'll be a 4-2 to two loss for the Wild, unfortunately. You'll definitely see Ovechkin score, stuff like that, or most likely, or Backstrom. It'll be one of those big shots. Don't be surprised to see Oshie, you know, boy, if we go to, if we go to the shootout, oh no, here comes Oshie again, he's going to save the day, right? I don't even want to think about that. I mean, anyway, you know, I mean, there's so many, so many good players. Justin Williams, you got one after another. And of course, Holtby, he's a good goalie too. And they got a good coach. It's just an overall good team. And maybe this is finally the year they break through and win it all. I mean, I've never been a fan of the Capitals, uh, other than when they had Dino Cicerelli, I suppose, but that's about it. <laughs> and that's way, way, way back in the day. This schedule kind of sucks. It, it kind of sucks. Uh, I don't like it at, at all. Uh, Florida Panthers come to town. Yaromir Yager who just keeps doing what he's doing. I mean, 43, whatever. He's just going to keep scoring. He's just going to keep doing it, and he's going to keep moving up the career totals overall uh, for the uh, for the NHL. Oh, man, man, man. Oof, there's a lot of injured guys out here, though. Unfortunately, Willie Mitchell, you won't see him play with a lower body injury on injured reserve as of January 21st. He's been out for quite a while. So many other names out there. Mark Savard has been out since October 8th. Post-concussion syndrome, that really sucks. Uh, very strong defensive team with timely scoring. You got Roberto Luongo, who the Wild used to roast and toast when he was a member of the Vancouver Canucks now, not so much. And even at Montoya, who's a decent goalie as well as the backup, regardless who's in net, Florida's going to win the game. It's going to be a frustrating one. You're going to see a 3-2 to two loss for the Wild against the Florida Panthers. Yager will probably score, most likely. <laughs> he just will, you know. And it's not just because, oh, he's the biggest name and all that. But he's consistently scored against the Wild pretty much forever. He's another one of those guys who's on the list of like leading scorers all time for the Minnesota uh, uh, for Minnesota Wild opponents, and he's having such a good year. And it's like you don't want him to ever retire. I mean, forty-three points on the year, twenty goals, twenty-three assists on the season. Just keeps climbing up those totals, totals for total goals. He passed Brett Hall this past week. Just unbelievable. I mean, he is unbelievable, and he just keeps going. And it's so funny how ten years ago, ten bleeping years ago, when he was in his thirties, it's like this guy's this guy doesn't give a rat's ass about hockey. He doesn't care anymore. He's he's done. And then you get him at forty three, and, and look at him, just a great, just a just a man out there. Right? He's a man among boys out there. Just amazing. Nick Bustead, doesn't that just piss you off? Doesn't that just piss you off that he isn't here? Ugh, it, it it sucks. It sucks. He's a talented young guy over there as well. For 19th overall pick in 2010, that was in the Grandland draft, actually taking one pick ahead of, uh, actually, no, no, he's behind Grandland. What am I talking about? Grandland was 10th. But um, I don't know. It's not like his coin totals are better than Grandland's at this stage. But at the same time, he's, he's had a he's had a nice little run the past couple of years Florida, for the Florida Panthers. Continues to play well. It's been a quiet year. He, he's actually, you could say, culpable to Grandland at this stage. But I'd still take him as a free agent if we could. I would. Uh, ah, let's just get off it. Whatever. I mean, you got Campbell too, one of the best defensemen. <clears throat> Kulikov as well. Ek, Ekblad. Uh, so much talent on this team. Even Kemper. Oh, that's funny. Stephen Kemper, who was on the Wild before, he's one of the bottom two defensemen for the Florida Panthers. Three to two loss. And I gotta talk about who's gonna be the most likely scorers in the game. I, that might be a good idea because I've been doing that before. Against Philadelphia, you will see uh, most likely, the most likely guy to score, Charlie Coyle. I think he's going to break out of his slump against the Philadelphia Flyers. Against the Washington Capitals, You, the most likely guy to score in that game is going to be Zach Parisi. He's, he's got to kind of break out of his slump as well. He'll be the guy to score against that big name team. And he'll, he'll make things interesting. It'll be like a one goal game or a tie game when he scores. It'll be a, a good moment, but Washington will pull away. Against the Florida Panthers, the most likely guy to score is going to be Matt Dumba. Matt Dumba will score on the power play in that one against the Florida Panthers. Matt Dumba. And then now we go to the Colorado Avalanche. Woohoo! Or at least we host them to open up the month of March. Get your Shamrocks ready. Get your uh, Guinness ready for uh, St. Patrick's Day. All that good stuff. The Green Machine going to rock the town without being seen. There you go. Okay, that's turtles, but you get the idea. <laughs> 
Uh, just hearing that yesterday on Paul Allen, I bet, yeah, they weren't singing for the Turtles. They just call them the Green Machine, but I'm, I, I didn't really went to Turtles in that one. Um, but the Wild will host the Colorado Avalanche Tuesday, March the 1st, and they will win that game. That'll end the bad streak against, uh, well, it'll end the bad streak for the Wild in Excel Energy Center, which has been a cursed building for the Wild, for nobody's understanding at this stage. The Wild will beat the Avalanche 4-2. to two. You'll see a nice effort. I'm going to go with uh, I can't predict five goals. That's too much. Four to two victory for the Wild, though. You're going to see a much better game against the Avalanche. Most likely a guy to score against the Avalanche. Who do you think? Who do you think it's going to be? Because he always scores against them. He always does. It, it, it's a mental thing, you know, between the Avalanche and him. Nino Niederreiter was the most likely guy to score against the Avalanche. Or Eric Halla. Uh Either one of them. I wouldn't be surprised if both of them scored in that game. But the Minnesota Wild will beat the Colorado, Colorado Avalanche. 4-2. to two. It'll be a very important victory for the Wild, and it'll get us at least a 500 record in this uh, four-game stretch, this not easy four-game stretch. So I'm trying not to cough to death, but <laughs> dump button there for the coughing, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Jerome again is back in town. Is he going to score against us? Eh, I wouldn't be surprised. He might get one of those two goals. Varlamov, uh, there was a time he was looked on as like this goalie the Wild couldn't beat. Now he's the guy that can't beat the Wild. Ha ha. Though even though the Avalanche beat us two to one December the seventh last time around, would have liked the Wild were going to start their slump. It was a final in overtime type of deal. You got two more games against the Lanch though, March the first, of course, which I'm talking about now, and then we head to Colorado March the twenty sixth. We'll find out what happens. We'll see how the Wild are playing at that stage. That could be a situation where the Wild are ahead of Colorado and keeping them out of the playoffs. But this will be an important victory for the Wild. It'll be a statement game, a four to two victory. More the wild, you'll see a lot of energy, and this team will be so determined to finally end that stupid, stupid ass uh, losing streak in XL Energy Center, which will not end against the uh, Florida Panthers, in my opinion, but it will end on Tuesday, March the first. Super Tuesday. <laughs> Super Tuesday. Yep, yep, yep. You <laughs> make America great again. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> here come the wild, and here we go. Make the wild great again as well, Torch. Get them, make them great again. Make them great again, baby. Build a wall between Minnesota and Colorado. Let's let's build a nice wall between the two teams. You know, the wild have a nice lead. It'll be a big wall. Colorado can't, can't get through. Nashville won't be able to pass it either at that point, hopefully. But nah, we won't catch Nashville this week. But uh, hopefully, hopefully we will catch Colorado this week. But maybe next, it may go a slide into next week because the Wild will only go 500, in my humble opinion. Let's check in on the prospects out there, eh? Dare we check in on them? You want to? Well, we're going to anyway, damn it. So stop, stop complaining, right? Uh, you got Alex Tuck over there in Boston College. He is the, <clears throat> I'm going into imitation mode here. He's the sixth leading scorer uh, in Boston College at this stage. Unfortunately, he's only on the on the second line right now uh, as a right winger. Only on the second line, 12 goals, 14 assists. He's certainly quieted of late. There was a time he had like 24 points in 26 games. He was hanging right in there, and he's gotten quieter the past couple weeks. Uh, it's disappointing. Only two points in about three, four weeks now for Alex Tuck over there. He's one of the big prospects for the Wild, but he's not standing out that much. So now you head into the uh, the minor league system for the Wild. I mean, there'll be times I'll check into other college players, but not today. Right now, the other guy, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tuck, it's kind of important to see how he's doing. It's too bad. He's just quieted of late. Uh, Gustav Olison's quieted as well a little bit. Yeah, I think he misses Torchetti already. <laughs> okay, pardon me. That was not intentional to rhyme. Gray back with one point this past week. He's now at 10 points in 25 games in Iowa. Uh, yeah, I don't think we'll be seeing Gravelock on the Wild uh, at this point, barring injury. It doesn't look like it. Uh, Eric Hall is playing so well, and Jared Stoll is playing well enough to hang in there. Uh, Schrader finally crosses the 30-point mark, though I'm sure he'd much rather be up with the Wild at this stage. Third down the team in scoring, but i got to say, he's the best offensive player on the Iowa Wild, without a doubt. Uh, Jared Knight, finally back from injury. He'd been kind of, you could call it rehabbing, per se, with the Quad City Mallards. That's kind of, I guess, what they do when he comes back in the minor league system. You go to the further down minor league system, the Quad City Mallards in the ECHL, uh, where Rafael Buceris is now like the fourth, fifth leading scorer down there. Fifth or sixth leading scorer, kind of like Alex Tuck with Boston College. 
Mm, that's too bad. Rafael Bucera, second round pick not that long ago. But uh, Jared Knight came back, four points, two goals, two assists in five games of the Quad City Mallards. Now he's finally back with the Iowa Wild in his first game. He gets his sixth assist of the year. Yeah. There you go, Jared. It's about bleeping time. He had seven points in the season in 33 games. The Jared Knight watch continuing to uh, be what it is. Uh, uneventful at this stage. Would like to see him turn it around. Um, you could kind of call him like... Uh, uh, my my personal little fan favorite. You know, like if he actually is able to score and get things going a little bit, it'd be really nice to see. Considering you had to give up, um, you have to give up on Zach Phillips, and he's what you got in return. Phillips not doing well in the Boston system. He did better starting out the season last year, just like Jared Knight did a little better here versus what he did in Boston, the the Providence Bruins. Uh, so, uh, damn it, <laughs> it's it's frustrating to see what's happening right now. With the Jared Knight, it's just another blemish on Chuck Fletcher's record, which is significantly better than Mr. Uh, Risebrow's record. I almost forgot his name, right? <laughs> Oof, the, unfor- the forgettable name by Doug Risebrow. Uh, almost no draft picks made it, even though Scandella actually is a Risebrow pick, so congratulations. He actually hit gold in one of them. But uh, Fletcher, it's like he may have kind of sort of missed on certain guys. But he did get some nice sleepers here and there. Like Eric Holler, the seventh round pick. Grayavok, seventh round pick. Uh, Bers- I keep uh, I kept calling on Burstachi, but it's Burtsky. Christoph Burtsky, who's still third, third leading scorer. He's been quieting down a bit, the center down there in um, in uh, the second line center down in uh, Iowa at this stage. Sixth round pick. He's, he's not doing bad in the minor league level, and he's still very, very, very young. 12, 2012 pick, so still got a long career ahead of him. Um... But yeah, I mean, there are names out there, and and there's a possibility there are there's there's warm blood in these players. Where where Mr. Risebro, most of those guys, you know how when you look through trades, you look through names in the draft and all that stuff, like past drafts, and some of them have a link where you can click on it, and there's numbers, you know, like oh he did this in the NHL and he did that, and oh he's still playing, yeah, there he is, 28 points last year with Edmonton, okay, well you know, or oh he's got 46 points. But yeah, usually you only see that when it's a guy that Risebrow traded away. But when it's a draft pick, black, no, no link, just never came here. Like like Oscott Ra- Rachebulin, whatever his name was, even years ago, never did Jack S H I T in the NHL. Might as well just say it. But never did Jack shit in the NHL. Um, stuff like that, where there's warm blood, and a lot of them are still on the ros- are still on the Wild system or on the NHL roster. So that's good. Uh, there you go. Uh, so Fletcher will probably keep his job, but you never know. If this team totally tanks the rest of the year, Fletcher's probably gone, just for the sake of change. But at the same time, Fletcher more likely to keep his job than Mike Yo certainly was, because at least there's some names around. It's not quite as bad as Risebrow, even though the covers are much more bare than we would have hoped. Uh, some of those bare covers kind of heated up again a bit. Uh, Torchetta took him out of the freezer, and there was a little pulse in him. That's nice to know. So far, some of the guys that are actually on the Wild. And he was also doing the same for the Iowa Wild down there in the AHL level. So, good on him there. Good on him, mate. <laughs> good on you, mate. <laughs> I love how he says power play. See, he, he almost sounds like a Canadian at times. But when he says power play, there you go. Yes, he is from uh, Massachusetts, Boston, Massachusetts. Power play. we got to work on a power play. <laughs> I love you, Torch. Love you. Um, he's a good hockey coach. Is he the right guy long term for the Wild? Who knows? But he just have, definitely deserves the right to, uh, well, <laughs> have, a, have a shot at the job. He's done a good job so far, and I like how the players are responding and just simply attacking the net. Some of it's just common sense stuff. You know, Greg Popovich and the Spurs, common sense stuff. Like, you know, just to move the ball around and, and create space. You know, that's basketball, but you get the idea. Um, some some of the best coaches have a lot of common sense and fundamentals, and I think Torchetta's common sense and fundamentals there's nothing super complicated about it, and it's a different groups of players playing together for the for uh, playing on the same line probably for the first time ever, and they're playing well, and it's cool, more interchangeable. Nice to see, nice to see, and you're seeing Mike Riley on the power play already, and he's scoring points already. He's going to have a nice career in the NHL, and I'm so glad the Wild were able to get him, and he wasn't wasn't signing with the Columbus Blue Jackets in the fourth uh, as a fourth round pick of theirs a couple years back, so. Great. Glad, glad, to have, glad to have him and nice to see that it's working. Because it was working down in Iowa with Mike Riley, so why shouldn't it work with him up here under Torchetti as well? They were working well together, as was Gustav Olsson. <clears throat> I'm excited to see 
maybe if Olsen somehow comes up during this season, but eh, we'll see what happens. With that, I better uh, let you know how to get to the Facebook group and the uh, Twitter account. I was almost about to sign off here, but it's like, no, we better get to the uh, contact details. At Brave the Wild for the Twitter account. Would really appreciate you following that and interacting with me anytime you like during games and even not during games, just during the week, anytime you want. <clears throat> Excuse me. Facebook.com forward slash Brave the Wild dot Minnesota. Facebook.com forward slash Brave the Wild dot Minnesota. Thank all of you that have all of you that have followed the Facebook page by well clicking like on it, of course, on the big like button. And uh, just want to thank you so much for those of you that have told your friends about the show. Thank you, Chance, very much for that. As, and others out there on Twitter, Tanae Brown, Vince Germano, thank you so much for retweeting over there in, in Australia and New Zealand. Wouldn't it be cool if there's hockey fans out there as well? Wouldn't that be something? Maybe there are. Huh? And I think Vince and uh, Tanae do listen, uh, even though it's, hockey's probably not a super familiar sport for them at this stage. But, hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they like it, though. And you got a team to cheer for, right? <laughs> so there you go. We bring some, bring some Aussies in, some New Zealanders as well. <laughs> Those of you here in Minnesota, keep telling your friends about the show. Please give a nice positive rating on iTunes. It can, it only helps. Uh, there were some trolls like a year ago and a couple of years ago. Just stupid comments that are unnecessary, untrue, that type of stuff. Just, just trolling because they're bored, basically. So, if you could write a nice positive review or just give it a nice positive rating, just give it this five stars, four stars, whatever. It's a great, great help to the show, and I'll be kind enough to uh, shout out to you, particularly if you write a review, because I'll see your name on there. But, um, again, thank you very much, and God bless, and hope for a good, strong week for the Wild. Hopefully better than 500. <clears throat> That'd be nice, but at least get to 500, and then we can go from there and hope to... <laughs> Hope to survive this and make the postseason after all. 